Introduction to Philosophy, Lecture 7 on Metaphysics and Epistemology. Chapter 7 introduces the paradox called the Ship of Theseus. The Theseus paradox is a piece of what you could call identity metaphysics. In identity metaphysics, we're primarily concerned with numerical identity as opposed to qualitative identity. An example of this would be if you suppose you meet uh, identical twin brothers. Those brothers may be qualitatively identical in that they look the same way, they, maybe they have the same personality, whatever it may be, but each brother can only be numerically identical to himself. Personal identity is a kind of numerical identity. It's a relation that we have to ourselves. The term identity as it's used in other disciplines, such as sociology, psychology, or other social sciences, uh, is typically closer to how we use the term in our quotidian discourse than how we use it in philosophy, because in philosophy we'll apply it to objects which we typically don't in our everyday talk. But we do use the term identical in our everyday talk when discussing objects. So we could say two objects, two vehicles, two whatever are identical to each other, but we typically wouldn't talk about the identity of the vehicles or objects. But that's something that is normal in identity metaphysics. Which brings us to the ship of Theseus. The ship of Theseus is first explained in our text, at least the paradox is first explained in our text, using the example from Plutarch, who explained that it was the ship that belonged to Theseus and his crew, and when he returned to Athens, the Athenians decided to preserve it in his, in his memory, in his honor as a hero. And over time, when parts would rot, they would replace them. When planks would start falling apart, they'd put in new planks. And with the continued renovations, some philosophers came to use it as a standing example of the logical question about numerical identity, about the question of how things grow and change over time. Do they keep their identity or are they something new now? One school of thought would be that the ship, even having undergone numerous renovations and perhaps all of its planks replaced, would say that it still remains the same ship, but another school would contend that no, not a single piece of that ship is apart from the original ship. It's a new ship. Our text looks at different examples of this paradox from history and across cultures. And it also looks at some possible solutions, but it spends the most time on Aristotle's solution to this problem. For Aristotle, the solution is found in his four causes. Now, the way he uses the terms, the term causes isn't always the same as we do in our everyday talk either, save for one, the efficient cause, which we'll get to. The first cause that Aristotle would appeal to is the material cause. The material cause of the ship would be the wood that it's made out of, the, the metal components, the ropes, the material for the sails, and so forth. The second cause would be the formal cause, that's the shape or the arrangement of all the parts. The efficient cause, which is closer to the way we use the word cause today in our regular talk, would be the uh, naval architect, the shipbuilders, everyone that uh, brought it into existence by building it, shaping all the planks, all the pieces, and putting them all together. That's the efficient cause. The fourth cause for Aristotle is the final cause, and final as Aristotle's a teleologist, he sees the final cause as the end cause or the goal, the purpose of the ship, and that is to float and move through water and move through water well. So his solution depends 
on the formal cause and the final cause. So long as the ship continues to retain its formal cause, the shape and arrangement, and its final cause being able to do what it's supposed to do, namely sail, then it retains its identity. The change of parts over time is only a material change. The formal identity and the final identity of it remain intact, so the identity remains intact. However, Hobbes, Thomas Hobbes, has a more interesting version of this paradox. In Hobbes' version, not only are all of the pieces, all of the planks, all of the beams, everything, replaced over time until one day there's a ship with all new pieces, he would have us consider every original piece that was taken off over time was stored maybe in a warehouse somewhere. And then someone decided one day to put all those original decaying pieces back together. And now there's Theseus's ship in the harbor, call it Theseus 2, and Theseus uh, 3, this Theseus 1, but reassembled, making essentially three ships. There's the original ship that disappeared once all of the pieces were replaced, Theseus 2, the ship that's in the harbor, and now Theseus 3, all the parts that were pulled off and then set aside. So now Hobbes has us ask ourselves, what are we to say about this? Um, are we going to say that we have two numerically identical ships? We can't say that because that's absurd. It's uh, the opposite of what numerically identical means. So to solve this problem, we do have one attempt from one of our contemporaries, E.J. Lowe. He tries to solve this more complicated problem by appealing to ordinary and extraordinary cases of assembly and disassembly. The well, the assembly and disassembly of composite objects. Us as the owners or the naval architect or the shipbuilders, we can decree by removing and replacing parts that once a part is removed, it's no longer part of the ship. And once a part is put into the ship, it's a part of the ship. It's been appropriated by it and it retains its, its identity. After all, it's our ship. In an ordinary case, we could take our ship, we could take half of it off, say the top half, so half of it's still floating in the harbor, but the other half is in a warehouse. Now, we could say that we have one ship with half of its components in the warehouse and the other half still in the harbor. Now, let's say we use new pieces to complete the ship that's in the harbor. It would be very weird to say I have one ship with half of its components in the harbor and the other half in the warehouse, and to say at the same time that you have a complete ship with all of its components in the harbor. Like, that's just not how it works. Like, if you modified your car or something, it's still your car. It's not that you have, maybe you take off 25% and replace and update 25% of your car. It's not that you have 25% of your car in a garage and then 100% of your car here. This is your car. So, just like the ship, if you had half of the ship, in the warehouse and the other ship that's been completed with new parts in the harbor, you wouldn't say that you have two ships. You'd say that you have one ship and a whole bunch of parts in a warehouse, just like with your car. If you replace 25% of it, you wouldn't say you have two cars, one with 75% of it over here and 25% of it here. You'd say you have one car and a bunch of spare parts if that makes sense. So 
Theseus 1 doesn't exist anymore because of the total renovation. Theseus 2 is floating in the harbor, and Theseus 3 is all put back together, or according to uh, Lowe, put together for the first time because all of those parts have been disappropriated. They're not actually part of any Theseus anymore. So putting them together, we're supposed to look at it as them being put together for the first time, which also seems weird. For Aristotle, Theseus II is still the same ship because it had the continuity of formal and final causes. However, that's kind of weird when we consider that Theseus III is all the old, old parts put together and it's a complete ship. For Lo, Theseus II is also the same ship. That's because of his principle of uh, disassembly and reassembly and appropriation and disappropriation. However, if a forensics team came and analyzed both ships and there's a spot on the ship where Theseus is said to have slain uh, some enemy and they find a blood stain and are able to test it and say, oh yeah, this is the blood of the person that um, Theseus uh, slew in that battle. So Theseus three is the actual ship. So, so much for all the theorizing and working our way through this paradox to make sense of it. The forensics team has confirmed, yes, this is actually the spot where that happened. So this has to be the ship. When we find paradoxes like this, we want there to be a solution. And for all the theoretical elegance of Aristotle's approach, appealing to his four causes, and also the intuitive approach of low, because that's pretty much how we think about things when we add or subtract, make modifications to one of our vehicles. But then when you tweak the paradox just a little bit, it shows that no matter how we think about it or how we try to solve the paradox, one way you try to solve it, you run into trouble. And the other way you try to solve it, you run into a different kind of trouble. So it could be that this is a proper paradox. Or it could also be that our conception of identity isn't as clear as we think it is.